Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to the COPEC Daily Broadcast. Uh, for those of you just joining us, um, we do have a daily broadcast starting at 2 o'clock. Our, our program runs from 2 to 2.30 in a conversational kind of format. We're uh, very happy to have Lori Wingard joining us again today, and I'll introduce Lori in a few minutes. Um, so uh, with the exception of holidays, we hope you can join us daily. Um, we also will extend the program a little bit beyond 2.30 if we have additional questions. So the entire year uh, programmed out. So, and uh, so at this point, we'll kind of get right into our program. Uh, Lori, of course, is president of her own home care agency located in Arlington. I think it's located actually in the Tremont Center and uh, home care assistance. So, uh, but Lori is just a great resource for all aspects of, of long-term care. So. We're delighted to have her back again today, and we've got an interesting topic, conversations. So I'm, I'm anxious to hear about that myself. So thanks for joining us, Lori, and uh, what can you tell us about conversations? Well, hi, Jerry. Good to be with you again uh, this afternoon. Um, conversations have to do with um, the ultimate way to make sure that your 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 wishes that you've always hoped to how you've hoped to live your final years that they come true um so i remember uh hearing a statistic um, a couple of years ago and i continue to use it in presentations when i do them that 66 percent of people have planned their funeral right which is amazing and good but the same percentage i think it's even a little bit higher 67 percent of people have not done any planning for what they want their lives to be like from retirement to death which could be 30, 35, 40 years. <laughs> so we've left a major portion of our life, you know, without having really planned what, what we want. And not just talking about financial, Jerry, that's kind of what you and the financial planners do is help people think that through and how do I make sure I have enough to live that way? But it's like, right. you, one thing we know about aging is that uh, it's not, you tend not to stay the same. Something's gonna give. There are declines in mobility, in cognitive abilities, and not always severe, and not always you know, significantly enough to change your life, but they will happen. So if you say, well, my plan is to live like this for 40 years and then die on a treadmill, um, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> but when they say, plan, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst, and that's yeah. what this is about. So it's not just about, planning, Jerry, and thinking about that you have to really think about what you want, what's important to you. And then you have to have that conversation with the people who are going to be part of your life. And it applies really not only to older people, is that right, Lori? Because we're finding life events happen, healthcare events happen um, at very young ages. So when do, you suggest, when do you suggest we start this conversational process? Yeah, I mean, my, it's interesting. My um, my parents have died recently, um, and my their grandkids they have and they have uh, eight grandchildren, and our family was I wouldn't say we were always very conversational about death. It was never a taboo subject, yeah. <laughs> and and sometimes we made fun of it. You know, we kind of made fun about the way that we want. My dad wanted to be put in a canoe, and we lived he lived on Lake Erie, um, put in a canoe and set on fire and pushed off into the. <laughs> <laughs> the horizon, <laughs> which is, I think, how Indians, I guess, Native Americans had done it for some time. <laughs> but, right. but having those conversations, ha growing up in a household like that, um, one thing that happened when both of my boys were with my parents when they both died, and it was not at the same time, um, but that fear of death and that fear of, um, and that confidence in knowing what is best for somebody kind of goes away a little bit when you're okay talking about those things as you go through life. So I've always said and um that you know i i would i kind of changed my mind i wouldn't mind being cremated but my family my boys know that you know i've always dreamed of like being in a pine box buried without a vault so that i can just go back to the earth <laughs> and they now have those kinds of services so um uh i also you know so it's just important to to say those things out loud and and to hear other people's views and have those conversations because you may change your mind as, as you go but it's those times that that make all the difference. So it's a little bit about having the conversation, but first of all comes the planning and thinking about what, what it's involved. And, you know, I think the cultures, at least in my own family, have kind of changed on that in terms mm -hmm. of their willingness and their ease of conversations. My grandfather was very, very private, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think he shared a lot about his finances 
with my own father yeah. for many, many years. But I think as the generation's coming down, my dad mm -hmm. was very good about sharing more with me, not just the financial part, but what his desires were for, yeah. you know, funerals and things yeah. like that. So. Yeah. So I'm in my late 50s and I already, I have a document <laughs> that I've given to family um, that says, here's how you even get into my computer, right? That's <laughs> step one. That, that is huge. Yeah. And then here's who to call if it's a sudden death about my business. Um, here's, you know, here's where my bank, here's where I bank, here's my financial planner, you know, here's, you know, just listing names and I didn't list phone numbers, let them figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> but then I also told about which costs are recurring so that you got to get into my computer and go cancel these costs that are recurring, you know, and so I just thought, you know, and how easy is that? And it's just a Word document that I can update at any time. So that kind of planning obviously can be done at any time and really should be because um, even if you don't die, um, sometimes being you know convalescing or being unconscious for a while even if it's temporary is it still can put the whole family in a in a stir not knowing quite what you, what you want and what your wishes are so, so it's important to document things both mm -hmm. your vital papers i suppose vital yeah. records yeah. but also maybe more things like your legacy and, and yeah yes both financial and not and those are all things that what you're talking about those are th Great. Those are things that happen after your death, right? So helping people plan for after your death is great, but having conversations and thinking actually before you even have a conversation, the first thing you have to do is really think about what you want. So I'm going to share a screen here because um, there are a couple of resources that I have been using in presentations over the years. And one of them is this, it's just, it's, it's a simple, it's a program called the One Slide Project. I'm going to pull that up for you. And it is actually just one slide um, and you could look that up online you can see down there in the bottom left engage with grace.org oh great but it just says you know to sit down um, and answer these questions for yourself if there were a choice do you prefer to die at home or in a hospital so you know and put that down on a scale of one to five how important that is this is so simple could a loved one correctly describe how you'd like to be treated in case of terminal illness? Because sometimes we think, well, I'll just tell the doctor not to revive me. <laughs> but you forget, you're not gonna necessarily be conscious enough to share that information. So you have to think about, um, you know, how, what can you handle? And as we age, things change. Like right now, I feel very vibrant and healthy and I feel like do whatever you can um, to, to bring me back. Um, I, I, I have determined I don't think I would, I would hate it, but I wouldn't mind being wheelchair bound. Like, um, but if it's head injury, then probably just let me go. I mean, those kind of conversations are hard, but you have, that's what you have to think about. And then you have to think about, you know, is there someone you trust whom you've, you've appointed to advocate on your behalf when the time is near? And this is, Jerry, to your point, it's not even just death re related, right? right? It's like, who do you say? Um, at this point right now, I would say, you know, who do you say in your life? Is it, a, is it a spouse or your children or a sister or a brother? You say, if I'm in the hospital and the doctor has questions, um, you know, this is the person I want to be my healthcare power of attorney. This is the person I'm at least going to have a conversation with so somebody knows about what I want. And then the last part, number five, is something that people often think about. And those are the documents that matter um, at the time of death. But like I said, there's like 35 years between now and the time of death for a lot of people. So thinking about what you want is, is really critical. And you know, I think it's also important, we really try to advocate not only picking the initial important person that you want to fulfill these particular roles, but also backup people. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes we run into the fact that the person maybe you first name as, as an advocate isn't yeah. available or maybe they're kind of in a, a point in their life where they can't really serve. Mm -hmm. So it is important to actually have backup people yeah. to these. Absolutely. And it's not an easy decision. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about financial powers versus healthcare powers. Yeah. And I think about who I've named and my, we have four kids and, and uh, there was a very likely one that I would pick for financial decision making. Mm -hmm. It's my astute son that is really good with numbers very responsible financially, mm -hmm. but I'd never give him the power for health care. Uh, he's, he's afraid of blood. <laughs> <laughs> he may be watching this at some point, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. But I got a, a, my other daughter, you know, if, if I have a problem, emergency, mm -hmm. she's going to beat me to the hospital. She'll beat the emergency uh, 
van to the to the hospital. So it can be difficult, but it's very important to kind of the right people for those roles. Yeah. It is absolutely that's exactly right. And then um, kind of like the the climax of this whole conversation is is about having that conversation. So as we're getting at, it's like it's not important enough that you just think about these things and putting them in writing. Those are st good steps one and two. But step three is having that conversation because you might know this. You might have told me this. It might be recorded on Zoom. <laughs> but if your your daughter and, and son don't know these things and don't really know what you know what your plans are, what your wishes are, then it's not they're going to be really hampered because they're going to have to dig through a lot of paperwork to see if maybe you've written it down somewhere versus simply like sitting down and say, I kind of want to talk to you about where I am with things. Um, and it's not as scary as it sounds, but it is certainly something a lot of families, like I said, just aren't comfortable with that level. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the parents sometimes are very hesitant to, to talk about with their children. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, children sometimes don't want to broach the subject. So it's yeah, and I think so that's so that's a really good point, Jerry, because I think I, we don't always know who's watching these videos. So either either or like if you're the older adult, then please, you know, if you haven't had a discussion yet with your with your family, just do it and don't make it around a holiday. <laughs> so just say, you know, I'd like to get everybody together or on a Zoom call because you just kind of want to share with our thoughts on, you know, where our paperwork is, who our POA is, who our healthcare power attorney is and what I'm hoping. Um, because what you say out loud so many times are things that aren't necessarily in writing. Like neither my parents didn't ever put in writing that they wanted to be cremated. It was only through conversation that we, we knew that. We all clearly remember that we all were there when they've all said, yeah, just cremate me. <laughs> dump yeah. me in the, which, you know, we couldn't dump them in the water. We had to bury them, but we wanted to bury them. That's our, you know, what we do. But, um, but things like, so a lot of people will say, of course, in our, in our field, we hear a lot of, you know, I want to live at home as, you know, forever. I want to live at home no matter what. Yeah. And that is completely possible. But if you tell somebody that versus like, I don't mind um, moving to a memory care unit someday, like that, if that's what you need to do, I understand. That's really, really helpful to a child to hear that choice of yours um, at that point. So if you're the, the older adult who's watching and haven't done that yet, just find a time to work through the, the content on this slide here and, and have that conversation with your family. They'll be forever grateful. Some might find it awkward, but like you said, Jerry, it's a real blessing to have a family that can talk about these things openly um, and not see it as sort of a, um, a morose topic. Because, you know, I'm sorry, it's, it's about the most factual thing in our lives <laughs> that there will be an end to it. <laughs> and if you're the younger uh, person watching this, who certainly this is a great time to say, now I just watched a great webinar about having a conversation about your final wishes. So mom and dad or aunt and uncle, let's sit down and do that. I want to hear what's on your mind. Um, and it can start out, it doesn't have to be all done in one meeting. You know, you don't have to go in with an agenda. You can say, do you have any thoughts that you want to share? And um, just start a conversation. And you might say, you know, you might come up with a lot of things that you want to research or they want to look into or, um, and then you can set a meet, meeting in the future to do that. So it's, it's really empowering to do that because you have to think about, uh, I, we've had um, clients where we've heard, we had a client one time, we heard them say, well, before their dementia set in, that they would love to live near their grandchildren someday who were in another part of Ohio. So when the, when the dementia increased, we were able, just as a you know, separate non-family entity, be able to tell the family, we heard them say this. So um, I don't know if that's possible, it's in your wheelhouse, if you're even gonna be in the same place for very long. And that made such a difference for that family to know that it was more important for them to be near their grandchildren than to be in their home. Um, so it might be the opposite for somebody else. You know, one thing that crossed my mind is, particularly if there's multiple siblings, and this is kind of the downside of not having the conversations. Mm -hmm. We have seen really families kind of torn apart if mm -hmm. these things aren't put in place, not only the financial documents, but the conversations. Yeah. And uh, we've just seen a lot of, unrest in the family between siblings, or if parents tell one sibling their wishes, but really haven't shared that with everybody. Um, to, to Especially if the person they've told is not the power of attorney, that's where we've seen some struggle come in. So the POA doesn't know this, 
but the daughter who's lived in the same town with them for 10 years has heard them say this over and over again. So, but the POA is like, but that's not what, I'm the POA here. And she's like, but you have to trust me, this is what they said. So um, yes, I agree. It's not, it's talking to everybody. So you're all on the same page at the same time, ideally, um, because there will be questions and decisions will be made. Um, but if not, you know, if not everybody at the same time, at least make sure you had a conversation with everybody in the family who's going to be part of your care team. You know, when we're uh, doing planning work with a lot of our clients, and let's say they, they might be in their late 40s or early 50s, um, so we're trying to take a holistic viewpoint. We're not attorneys, but we're obviously encouraging them to do estate planning work for themselves and their children. And, you know, we get into maybe a discussion of inheritances and and so often we hear, well, I don't really know what my parents intend on that or what they've done with their estate planning. Mm -hmm. We're not expecting a lot of inheritance, but we don't know how to help them. And uh, so the conversation can be tough, but a lot of, or some of them will say, to, to use us as an excuse saying, hey, mom and dad, I just did some estate planning work um, and updating with our own estate plan. Have you, yeah. have you updated yours lately or just anything to ease into that Great conversation? Idea. Yeah, yes. Put it, put it in those terms. And the interesting thing is we find that when, if you, like families who do most, I mean, in the hundreds of, hundreds of families that we've worked with over the past decade plus, I have not seen any of the things that you hear about in the movie made for television where the kids are fighting over the money. I know it happens, believe me, but it's not as common as you think. Truly, people are most, for the most part, good people. And, yeah. and um, um, but when parents say it out loud, it's like, oh no, I don't want you to spend this money on, you know, for me to be at home. I want the money for you. I want to save it for you. I don't, I don't want to spend all the money. I want, to, I want to pass it on to the kids. Yeah. If you could say that out loud, many times the adult children will say, I don't, I don't want your money. I, want, I, don't want, I don't want to be the sole caregiver for you. You know, this trade-off is that, I'd much rather have you spend it now on you so I can be a daughter or a son again and not be your primary caregiver. And right. then whatever, whatever falls, you know, whatever comes in the future with whatever's left, that's fine. But don't worry about saving it for me. Spend it for your best life right now. And that's, that's a great thing for adult children to, to hear and be able to share with their parents as well. Yeah, I agree. We, we hear the positive most often and that's in the same terms. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There is, a, um, there is a website. Let me see if I can share this one because this is another really cool uh, website. So there was a journalist named, it, she's still alive, but her name is Ellen Goodman. And she was a columnist in major newspapers. So a lot of you may have heard of her. But she realized that this conversation wasn't happening um, in her own family. So she created a website. And you can see the URL right there, the conversationproject.org. And there's the, the purpose of it, helping people share their wishes. For care and then if you look down even farther there's Ellen Goodman if you remember what she looks like um, I'm trying to find so I think it might be over here like starter kit you can click there and you can get a whole you can download a workbook for free that just walks you through this the, the steps that we've just had we've discussed there's things in here how to talk to your doctor you know make sure your doctor is a part of your um, your healthcare planning as well, not just the person giving you the reports on your healthcare. Right. So definitely recommend that website. There's so many amazing tools there. And that's a good thing. I mean, that's something that may be harder, harder for older adults to, to navigate, to find this page, to download it, to pull it up, to print it. So gosh, what a gift, you know, for your the loved ones in your life, if you can watch, do that for them. Right. Yeah. Well, we're definitely trying to have more, encourage more family meetings. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really going to keep well, Jerry, when it. people, yeah, I have a question. When people come to you um, for their final documents, what are they mostly missing? Because we will, we will say to our clients, like, do you have everything in order? And they're like, I think so. But um, tell, if you could just do a quick, you know, review sure. of what's important. As far as a missing documents concerned, the one that we see missing most often is the financial power of attorney. And that's, of course, giving a trusted individual the ability to act for you financially when you're unable to um, act for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so 
Um, you know, as far as a miss, missing document, that's most often. Um, but just in general, I, I would say as much as 80% of the people come in and we get into all of these discussions, we'll say, I need to update my, my estate plan or my, my will. So I think in general, there is just a lack of, you know, people keeping up with that. Yeah. And so we try to act as a catalyst and, and promote that and try to help them yeah. make the connections to the proper attorney to get yeah. that. So. Yeah. Good. And, and there's some things that aren't even part of those documents that matter. So for example, um, making sure, so if you have an older loved one in your life, you know, maybe ask them if it's okay. Can I, you know, say, can you tell your doctor it's okay for me to call them and ask questions on your behalf? Um, Cause doctors won't be able to speak to you unless the, your name is on the list. Doesn't even have, you don't even have to be the healthcare finance or healthcare power of attorney. Um, we had all, me and my three siblings were all on the doctor list um, for both of my parents. So if any of us had any questions or they were confused, my parents were confused about something, medication or something they were told, any one of the four of us could pick up the phone and call the doctor and they were permitted and it shows up on their screen and they say, who are you? And what they'd ask the security questions. And then they'd be able to share that information about their, about their healthcare with us. I'm so happy you mentioned that. I'm going to amend my answer. It's the HIPAA <laughs> form. It's the HIPAA form that's most often missed. And then second would be the financial power. So um, even with younger children, I mean, you know, once they turn 18, they're mm -hmm. considered to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And even to be able to, you know, they might be at college or something like that and yeah. something happens. Now, I think a lot of doctors and physicians are pretty liberal about it if they have a good feeling that they're talking to the parent. But technically, um, you know, a HIPAA form needs to, the authorization needs to be given. So yeah. I'm right. glad you brought that up. That yeah. really needs to be emphasized. And so while we're talking about, you know, the final documents and things, that's all critical. And I know there are plenty of uh, opportunities in the COPEC Zoom program to be able to hear conversations about that. But this is maybe the only one where we talk about the real importance of thinking about this ahead of time. And I can't tell you how many times people just don't do this. I just kind of want to go back to that too. And uh, making sure that you, first of all, that you're not in denial that you're aging. Right, right. <laughs> and that um, there will be some decline inevitably uh, every year for the rest of your life. Um, so don't make that plan, you know, be that you're just going to die in your sleep. So um, you know, really think about, you know, um, is, you know, is your house ready um, if you want to age there? Um, what is your plan B? If you don't want to age in your house, where do you want to go? Even if you don't ever want to leave, where might you want to live? You know, it might, it's kind of empowering if you're the older adult to say, to tell your children, you know, I've already toured three different, you know, facilities and this is the one I want to go to if I absolutely need to. But my preference is to stay home, but if you want to so it's kind of, if that's important to you, then do it now and, and, and tell your family about it. Um, DNR information, you know, do not resuscitate information is extremely important. I know um, you have to make sure that the family knows where it is. So that's part of the conversation too. Um, I think doctors are getting better now with electronic DNRs. So if you go to the hospital, they should have it on record um, for the most part, what your wishes are about resuscitation. Um, but if not, if it's not easy to be found, they're going to do what they can to revive you, even if it may not be um, what you wanted, what you wanted to happen. And then it's really important too to talk about um, everybody in your family's capacity for caregiving. Um, we saw it come out in, in my family too. Like some of us could can get in there and do a bed bath. <laughs> um, my parents both had professional caregivers with them in their home, but. Um, but there were week, you know, there's times we want, you know, in weekends we were there and we let one of them go, the caregivers go home early. So we stayed with mom and um, there were others of the siblings who said that, nope, I'm good. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, and also know is if that's, if you're the old, think about who you um, want, can see as your caregiver and have that conversation with them because they might say, uh-uh, that's not, I know you, I know what you're saying, but that's not something I'm, they, you wouldn't say it in that way. You might say, I love you, mom. I hear what you're saying. But I think we need to plan for something different because, you know, I don't know what the future is going to look like, and I want to be your daughter and not just the person responsible for your, for your being taken care of. You brought brought up something interesting, and that is 
having these documents accessible to mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of newer things available. You have to be comfortable with the security of it, but kind of electronic storage kinds of systems that are available out there. <clears throat> and uh, so if you can become you know, comfortable with the security, um, you can put, you know, scan things and put things on cloud storage so you can access them wherever you are. Um, you know, people go on vacation, they usually don't take their health care power with them. Yeah. Uh, so what happens if you're out of town and something like that happens? Uh, so these permit you to access your documents and then have them be available on a local basis too. How would we find those kind of, those kind of electronic files? Um, I think just by going on the internet and kind of searching for, for that type. I'll give you one example. I'm not over promoting it, but Fidelity, the large investment company, yeah. actually, and they, they make this available to anybody. You don't have to be a client of, of Fidelity. And it's called FIDSAFE, F-I-D. I'm writing that down. <laughs> F-I-D-S-A-F-E, FIDSAFE.com. Okay. And so they've kind of pre-set up various files for various important documents. Uh, very easy. I can even do it, which is to upload, um, up, upload these documents. And um, I think it's like, what you know, two-level security, if you're familiar with that. Um, to be able to access. So it is a very, very high bank level of security. Um, and you mentioned something earlier too, and I'm glad you did it, which is your passwords. Mm -hmm. Everything we have pretty much is on computer these yeah. days. And that's a big estate planning problem yeah. if you're not sharing that. Uh, but again, you wanna share that securely with your important people and beneficiaries, so. Yeah. I put mine on a piece of paper. How secure is that? <laughs> Hopefully it's in there safe. That provide that capability. So But you know, even thinking about FIDSAFE, um, if you even so let's say you did that and you were very diligent and you put all of your things into FIDSAFE.com, the conversation, right? If you don't tell anybody it's there, nobody will have a clue to even look there. Yeah. Exactly. So um it, you may tell your spouse, but this, you never know the spouse might be with you when an accident happens or the spouse may be in such grief or, you know, um, that they don't remember. I mean, that's the last thing you can sit down and think about the details when you're going through a crisis. Yeah. So it's, this is this topic of having that conversation is just incredibly important. And that, that particular system gives you good educational information too, you can access mm -hmm. if it's helpful. No. So, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, you know, um, it is 2.30 already. Aren't we good? <laughs> much fun here, I guess. But anyway, as normal, it's kind of frustrating, but we're going to try to stick to our time limits here. So I do want to thank everybody that's joined us today, particularly thank Lori for joining us again. And uh, she's been agreeable to join us at least once a month on various long-term care topics. So look for her future programs. And uh, again, we'll kind of formally close the uh, program at this point, but we'll kind of keep things open. I'll keep my eye open if there's any additional questions. And uh, hope you can join us tomorrow in many future programs on a variety of topics. Thanks again, Lori, and we'll talk to uh, everybody a little bit later. Have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks, Jerry.